thanks for the intro, Megan. I'm going to do the right thing and not make the mistake that I made in the first session and just uh, kick off by sharing my screen. It's always a good start. Um, okay, so just a, a kind of a, a brief recap uh, as to you know, how we got to where we are right now. Um, we've had, as Ma Megan mentioned, three sessions already. Uh, in the first one, we did kind of very high level overview to what scraping is all about. And we took a look at um, how we can use screenshots uh, to retrieve some information um, from various websites. Screenshots not terribly useful because you can't actually extract the, the, the content for, for later analysis, but they're useful to just have a, a record of what a site looked like. And in the second session, we looked at uh, HTML, CSS and XPath. Uh, HTML just so that we had kind of an idea of how a web page is built and then CSS and XPath to give us two important tools for actually targeting specific elements on, on a web page. And then we also encountered two tools for generating the CSS or XPath selectors and those are developer tools which is a component of your browser and then also the selector gadget which is a, a browser plugin which is very, very handy for basically just clicking on a particular element on a page and getting the corresponding uh, CSS selector. And then last week, we actually started doing uh, scrapey, uh, scraping in earnest and we used the, the RVEST package to um, get, get data, data from, from static, static web pages. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at how to use Selenium for accessing the content on a dynamic uh, website. Just a, a quick recap of the distinction between a static site and a dynamic site. A static site is fully rendered on the server. So in, in other words, the entire contents of the HTML document is constructed on the server and it's delivered to you as the client, either in R or Python or just the web browser, intact. So everything is already in the page. And this means that extracting um, information from the page really then just boils down to finding the right selectors and then using those selectors to target the corresponding content and then extracting it from the page and storing it. However, with a dynamic website, uh, things are a little bit different because here there will be some content that's statically rendered into the page and delivered to you as the client, but the majority of the content is going to be rendered dynamically, which means that JavaScript is going to run normally in the browser and that JavaScript is going to go and retrieve content and render that into the page dynamically so that it's then displayed on your browser. Now the problem is that if you're using RVEST to scrape a dynamic site, then the only component of that site that you see is the statically rendered component, which is generally only a small fraction and as luck would have it, probably not the fraction of the page that you're actually interested in. So this is where Selenium comes into the picture. Selenium is a tool that allows you to essentially drive a browser programmatically and you can then, because you're driving this browser and the browser is rendering this page dynamically, you can then extract all of the content that you're interested in. Okay, so let's um, kick this off um, by taking a look at a, a simple demonstration and this basically ties into the, the demo that, that we had uh, last week, where, where you may recall that we went and, and extracted a whole lot of information for uh, members of parliament. Now, I'm imagining in my mind that I'm developing some sort of an insurance product that I want, might want to sell to these kinds of high flyers, like um, members of parliament. So I now already have a database with all of their email addresses and phone numbers, so I can hit them up and try and sell them my insurance product. And now I'm trying to think of other high flyers that might have similar profiles to parliamentarians and hmm, lawyers seem like they might have something in common. So maybe they would be interested in the same product. So what I'm going to do now is build a, a web scraper that's going to go and extract contact details for a whole bunch of lawyers. And as it happens, law firms, it seems, have these kinds of extensive directories where they provide basically a listing of everyone who works for them as well as their contact details. So this seems kind of ideal. So um, the site that we're going to be targeting is called uh, 
Weber Wenzel, and I'm sure that my pronunciation is poor because I come from Mattel. Um, let's just get that. So this is the, the URL for the page. I'm going to copy that and pop back to my browser and open it up. All right. And we're going to see kind of the, the home page that lists a whole bunch of their, their specialists as they call them, right? So you can see at the top here, we've got some selectors that allow us to basically slice the specialists according to the first letter of their name. And then we've got this directory. Now, here's the, here's the giveaway. Watch the scroll bar on the right hand side of the browser as I scroll down. You'll see that, oh, maybe not on this page because it's a short one. Let's see, Let's see maybe. Uh, you'll see that as, as I'm scrolling down, there's actually content that sort of appears to be like rendering in from the bottom of the page. Now what's happening there is that the, this website is going and actually retrieving this content from the website and then rendering it directly into the page. So this is a clue that it's not going to work nicely uh, for a static scrape, but let's, let's just give it a try in, in R anyway, right? So what I'm going to do is my little R script here, I am setting the, the URL storing in a variable called URL, loading up a couple of libraries, and you're going to see these libraries um, occurring a number of times in the session. So we've got Deplier for sort of basic data manipulation. We've got RVest for scraping static content and Stringer for just working with, with strings. So let's pull those three in. And now what we're going to do is use the, the read HTML function, which you encountered last week, to pull in the content of that page and it's going to be stored in this variable called HTML. And if we take a look at that, well, it looks like an HTML document. It's got a head, it's got a body. So I'm feeling optimistic that this is going to work. So now I'm going to use some of the tools from RVest. I'm going to pick out the, the title node and I'm going to extract the text from that title node. And then I'm going to use string trim because as it happens, there's a whole bunch of white space both before and, and after that text. And when I do that, I get the title for the page find a specialist. Okay, so th this is looking good. Now, what happens if I then go and try and extract actual content from the page? So I'm going to flip back to my browser. And I'm going to explore this page. And just you can see that there's a card for each of these specialists. So what I'm going to do is try and find a selector for each of those cards. So this looks like the div for the first card, there's the div for the second card and the third card, right? And you can see each of these has a specialist results class. So that's the class that I'm going to use to identify those particular cards. So back in our studio, um, I'm going to take my HTML and pipe it into HTML nodes, right? In plural, because I'm expecting there to be multiple results on the page and I'm now specifying the specialist results class. We know it's a class because it's preceded by a period. Now, when I run that, I get back a node set with zero elements. Hmm. So this means that I have got nothing back from the page. So this is a little bit ominous. It tells us that Arvest is not going to work for the site. Selenium to the rescue. We're going to revisit this site right at the end of the session and we are going to get the content for all of those lawyers. Okay, so back to the slides. Um, let's see. So this is where Selenium enters the picture. So Selenium is, is a, a package that allows you, it's, it's basically an interface between um, programming languages like R or Python and browsers. And it allows you to submit queries through Selenium that are then sent to the browser. The browser then does your bidding and it allows you to also interrogate the contents of the page that it renders. And the, the package in R for working with uh, Selenium is called R Selenium. So the first thing we got to do is load up R Selenium. Right, so we're now ready to roll from the R side, but there's still something else that we need to do, and that is get Selenium up and running. And that's what we're going to do next. But before I do that, and I, I realize that this may not be a very popular thing to say, um, if you are going to be using Selenium to, to scrape websites, you might want to consider doing it from Python. Why? Because the support uh, in the Python Selenium package is just a lot broader 
than in R Selenium. Right? Basically, all of the functionality in Selenium is supported in Python. Not all of it is supported in, in R, or some of it is a little bit clunky to access. Anyway, this is just something that's worth considering. Okay, so back to Selenium. Now, there, there are basically two approaches that you can take to this. The one is to install Selenium directly onto your machine. And I have done this, and it's, it's doable, but it's a bit of a mission because you've got to install a bunch of other stuff and you've got to get all the versions right to get it to work. What is a much better and more reliable approach is to use Docker. Right? With Docker, you can pull uh, any, any one of a number, number of versions of Selenium and, and to get, get it actually up and running, running in your machine, well, obviously you have, have to have Docker installed, installed but once you have Docker installed, it simply boils down to running Docker run and then specifying the image that you're interested in. So we're, we're from the Selenium collection of images, we're looking for the standalone Chrome debug image and specifying a particular version. I like to specify the version just so that I know exactly what I'm dealing with. You know, Selenium is, is being aggressively developed, so it does change over time. Uh, it's quite nice to kind of know that the thing that you're targeting is fixed. Right. Now, there are actually four different variations of this image. So there's the, the standalone Chrome and the standalone Firefox. And then there's the standalone Chrome debug and standalone Firefox debug. Now, the only difference between these two is that for the debug versions, you are actually able to see what's going on in the browser. Now, for me, this is super important because I'm going to be writing code in R that's going to be driving this browser, if it doesn't work the way that I expect it to work, then it's really useful to be able to actually see why it's not working. So the, the footprint of these uh, non-debug uh, images is slightly smaller, which means that their memory consumption is lower. But my preferred approach is I'm just going to use the, the, the debug version regardless. Okay. So this is how this is the simplest way that you can uh, instantiate that image, but we're generally going to want to provide a couple of other options to to Docker. So let's just run through these quickly. The first of them is minus D, and this means that it's going to launch the, the container as a daemon or in background mode. So in other words, it's not going to occupy your terminal. It's just going to chug away in the background. This RM flag means that when we stop the container, it's also going to be removed. Um, we then have these two P flags, and these are port mapping flags, and they basically tell uh, Docker to map a port on the container, so ports uh, 4444 four, 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 and port 5900, onto the corresponding ports on my machine. So in other words, these ports are the way that I'm going to communicate with Selenium running in my Docker container. I've also got this minus V flag, and this means that the, the shared memory on my laptop is going to be shared with um, the container as well. I'm giving it a name so it can be easily identified, and then finally providing the image name and the version number. So what I'm going to do is just grab all of that and then pop across to a terminal, uh, terminal window, and run it. So there we go, let's clean it up. So I'm going to paste that into my terminal. Uh, I see, this is, this is telling me that I already have a Selenium container and let's just check. So Docker PS tells me, yes, I do have a Selenium container. So let me stop that. Docker stop Selenium. Because I specified the RM flag before, that means it'll be removed as well. So there it's gone. Now let's run it again. So let's clean up my screen run it again and you'll notice that that returned very very quickly this is because I've already downloaded that image if you're doing this for the first time it's going to take you like maybe 30 seconds up to a couple of minutes to download the image um, but that only happens once right every subsequent time you run the image it's going to be almost instantaneous and now if I do docker ps I can see right there is my my selenium uh, docker container uh, running on the machine okay so let's go back to the slides now. Okay, so we've got Docker up and I mean, got Selenium up and running in Docker. It's, it's time to say a couple of things about this. And firstly, 
we I mentioned back here that there are these two different sets of images, like there's the standard ones and then there are the debug ones. ones. Well, well the, the the standard ones are what's known as headless. And this means that they there isn't actually a user interface for them. Like the the browser is there, it's working, but it doesn't actually have like a a manifestation, right? You don't you there's no way that you can see this browser. And this is the reason that we use the debug images because they actually render a real browser. But even though they're rendering this browser, the browser is still kind of tied up inside Docker. So we need to have a way of accessing this application that's running inside Docker and be able to see actually what it looks like. Normally when you interact with applications in Docker, it, it happens via like the command line or via code. So you're not actually interested in seeing stuff. But in this instance, we really actually want to see the browser. So the, the port that is exposed to allow us to do this is 5900, and 5900 is the, the port for VNC. So what we really need is to have a VNC view, um, viewer that's going to allow us to actually interact with the, the browser. And there are a couple of options. So these are the, the options for VNC on, on a Linux machine, and there are a bunch of others for, for Mac and for Windows as well. Okay, so install a, a VNC client, and once you've got that VNC client up and running, you need to actually connect to your, your uh, Docker container, and you do this by specifying the host and um, and port. So the, my local host is 127001, and the port is 5900. Right? So once I've specified those, I can click on the connect button. And the next thing, I get this uh, password challenge. Right? Please give me a password to access the, the, um, the container. This is no great secret. The password itself is actually secret. So you just type in secret and hit the authenticate button and when you do that you then get to see what the desktop looks like inside this docker container and you can see that it's a it's an ubuntu desktop with no applications running on it at present so what we're going to do next is to actually launch the browser in this docker container so we'll actually be able to see the, the browser and open web pages on it etc okay so Time for a demo. Um, let's do that. I'm going to flip back to um, our studio now, and I'm going to find the GitHub demo. Okay, so this is going to take us through the process of going to, to GitHub and interacting with it. But before we do that, it would make sense for me to crank up my VNC viewer. So I'm going to connect. I'm going to type in my local host and port, and then click the connect button. You'll notice I didn't get the, um, the challenge for the password because the last time I told it to remember the password. Right, so I've got the empty desktop here now, and I can go back to our studio. I'm going to set up um, the URL that I'm going to be visiting. So I'm going to this R open sci R selenium repository on GitHub, storing that. I've already got Docker up and running with uh, the Selenium image. So what I can do next then is to load the R Selenium library and I'm now ready to actually fire up the browser. So I go and instantiate this remote driver object and I specify a few things. So the first is the browser name. So I'm telling it that it's going to be communicating with Chrome and not Firefox. I'm telling it where to find it. So it's going to be sending uh, requests to this IP address, once again localhost, and the port number 4444. You'll remember we mapped two ports, that was the one and 5900 was the other. 5900 is for VNC, this one is for actually communicating with, um, with Selenium itself. So we run that. Nothing has happened in our Docker container yet, right? Now what we're going to do is open up the browser. So that's going to take a moment or two, and if I go back, aha, I've got an empty browser now running in Docker. I'm going to maximize it just because I can. And next thing we're going to do is we're going to tell the browser to navigate to the URL that I specified earlier. And just while we're looking at these things, I wanted to point out that this syntax uh, um, 
object name dollar method name is because the the um, RCDM package is implemented using reference, reference classes. classes. So this, this is, is kind of an, an, an object-oriented object approach to working with, with uh, information in R. So we've got a, a browser object and we are calling the navigate, navigate method and then providing with the parameters, which is the URL. So if I run that now and head back to VNC, we'll see that my browser is now navigating to that repository on, on GitHub. Right, so I'm now in a position where I can start navigating around the repository and extracting various bits and pieces of information. Let's see what we're going to do next. So we're going to play around with some navigation. So the first thing we're going to do is find the, the link for the issues tab at the top of the page and we're then going to go and click on it. So don't worry about the details of what's going on in this code for the moment because we're going to come back to it presently in great detail. We're going to talk about find element and click elements, etc. But just see that we're specifying that we're finding an element. We're doing it via a CSS selector and this is what that CSS selector looks like. And of course I've found this CSS selector by using developer tools. So here we are sitting. I'm aiming to click on this issues tab at the top there. So if I go back here, I'm finding the element and then clicking on the element. And if I go back to Selenium, you can see, aha, we've now moved to the issues page. So what I'm going to do next is find the, the link to the first issue on the page and I'm going to click on that as well. So go and have a look at what's the details of that first issue. So back in VNC, there's the first issue, and now it's opened up that first issue, which is called, uh, what well has title, Firefox Profile. And now I'm going to just show you a couple of very simple things for navigating back and forth. There's a, a go back method and a go forward method. So the go back method is going to take us back to the previous page, so the list of issues. And if I run the go forward method, it will take me back to that specific Firefox profile. Um, now, um, I'm going to go and extract some information from this page. Specifically, I'm going to go and get the title of the issue, and I'm also going to get the home page for the user, this MS Kusi, I think, um, who actually created this issue. So, I'm going to once again find an element, uh, and I'm going to go and get the element text. So that's the title for the issue, so Firefox profile. And now I'm going to go and get the, the link to the author's profile. So this, again, I'm going to go and find the, the appropriate element. And now I'm going to get the element attribute. So you remember from last week when we were looking at our vest, there were basically two things that we could do with um, tags on the page. One was to extract the content in those tags, like the text within the opening and closing tags. And the other was to extract information from the tag attributes. So in this case, we're extracting an anchor tag, so a link, and we're pulling out the value of the href attribute. So this is the URL that that anchor is pointing to. And we run that, and we see that we get the uh, URL for his, um, his homepage. Right. So, done with the demo, we've seen how to navigate in Selenium and how to extract simple bits of information from the page. Now we do the right thing, we shut things down in an elegant way, so I'm going to run the, the close method, like so. Go back to VNC and you see that my browser has disappeared. Now, I stepped through that script one line at a time, but ideally, if I'm writing, it, writing a scraper, I want to have something where I can basically click the button and then walk away and the scraper does its thing without me having to intervene in any way. So I would like, ideally, to be able to run the script by just pressing the source button and R should just run the entire thing from top to bottom. So, Let's see what happens if I do precisely that. Pressing source, going back to VNC. Right, so now, hands off. This is now R driving the browser. So we've got the home page. We're now going to, we've clicked on the issues, right? And then I'm expecting it to open up this Firefox profile link, but it seems to be taking an awfully long time. So let's go back to R Studio and see what's happened. Hmm, I see, I've got an error. 
right? What's happening here? Well, there's a very good reason for this. So it's, it's moaning about the fact that it's unable to find this particular selector. Why? Well, because when it attempted to find that selector on that page, the page hadn't actually fully rendered in Selenium yet or in Chrome yet. And this means that it wasn't actually there to find at all. So one of the important aspects of dealing with Selenium is that you now have to account for the fact that you're not getting this entire blob arriving in your machine at once. Basically, components of the page are being rendered incrementally. So you need to wait for the stuff that you're interested in to actually be on the page before you can start processing it. Okay, we're going to see how we can actually instrument this waiting time uh, later on. And we're going to revisit precisely the script and I'll show you how we can make with one small tweak the script run easily from, from top to bottom. Okay. Let's close that and go back to the slides. Okay, so we've already seen how we connect to Selenium, right? We run the remote driver uh, function. We specify the browser name, the server address, and the port. And in this case, localhost and port 4444. The thing that we get back is a, a remote driver object. So this remote driver object is the way that we communicate with the browser. So whenever we send commands to the browser, we're going to do it using this remote driver object. Now, just a word about this remote server address. Very often you will have, um, you will have this scraper executing on the same machine where Selenium is running. So in this case, I'm, I'm running my scraper on my laptop and I've got Selenium running on my laptop. But another possible configuration is that I have spun up an EC2 instance on AWS and I've got Selenium running on it and I'm running the scraper on that machine as well. But in that case, the scraper is also going to be addressing Selenium on localhost. So the IP address that it'll use is 127.0.0.1. However, it's equally possible to have Selenium running on a remote machine and to send requests to it from a local machine. So for example, I could have Selenium running on a server in the US and I could be sending commands to it from my laptop here in South Africa. Why would I want to do that? Perhaps I'm accessing a website that's only available to uh, requests that originate within the US, right? Or uh, if you're doing web scraping from China, then I'm guessing this would be a, a very appealing scenario, right? You've got to actually host your Selenium instance somewhere outside the grand firewall. Okay, so once we've actually created this remote driver object, the next thing we do is fire up the browser and we do that by calling the open method. It's got this optional argument silent, right? Which I normally specify as true because if you if you accept the default, then it's going to provide a couple, a bit of stuff on the terminal, which is not particularly informative. It's interesting to take a look at. Um, okay, I've mentioned that already. So once we've opened up the browser, we see the empty browser window. And the next thing to do is to actually take it to a page. And we do that by calling the, the navigate method. So browser, navigate, and we specify a URL. And here I'm just pointing out the fact that Delays are very important when working with Selenium. So you need to make sure that the content of the page has been rendered. So one option is to specify like a fixed delay. So say, wait five seconds because I know that the page is going to be fully rendered within five seconds or 10 seconds. This is fine. Um, and, and if time is not critical to you, then this kind of simple approach will work really well. I'm going to show you another sort of more robust and flexible way a little bit later. So the three things that you've just seen, um, creating a remote driver object, uh, opening, that, opening the browser and navigating to a URL are basically the three things that are gonna be done at the beginning of pretty much every script that uses uh, Selenium. So this is what our page is gonna look like once it's opened up in Selenium. Now we can start extracting information from Selenium so we can get back the, the current URL so we do that, it's a method on the browser object. So we get back the page that we're looking at and 
we can also pull out the content of the title tag. So title is kind of a special tag, so it's got this associated method get title. So we see that we get back this quotes to scrape. And that is what you would expect to see in the tab on the browser. So you can see in the, the tab for this particular page, it says quotes to scrape. So that's what we've retrieved there. We can get screenshots from within Selenium by just calling the, the screenshot method, right? So with, when you call the screenshot method, you need to provide it with a, a, the um, name of the file that you're going to be writing to. And we're going to see an example of that um, in, in one of the, the exercises or demos. Uh, this is a, a really useful thing to do. Um, if you are systematically scraping websites, you might want to take a snapshot of what the website looks like and then extract the, the text content as well. This is really useful, just at least during the development and debugging stages, because if your crawler does break, having that snapshot of the website as a, as a PNG or JPEG file is really helpful to basically figure out what went wrong. Okay. Now we're digging down to the important stuff. We've seen how to launch the browser. How do we actually navigate around and find the content that we're interested in? Well, we're going to use the find element method. And you will recall from our vest that we have the HTML node and HTML nodes functions, right? For grabbing a single node or multiple nodes. The same thing applies in Selenium. We have find element and find elements. You're going to see that in a moment. And we specify two things. Firstly, how we're accessing the, the element in the page. So in this case, we're using a CSS selector. This I think is a little bit verbose, right? Why don't they just say CLS, C CSS? Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, and then the next thing that you specify is the actual CSS selector. So here I'm picking out the first instance of the quote class on the page. And the thing that's returned is uh, a web element. So this web element class, we can now either use for further navigation or we can use it to extract information. So we can grab its text contents or we can grab its, its attributes. Um, there are other ways of addressing contents on the page. So you can provide a, a tag name, right? So here I'm specifying tag name is what I'm using. And I'm looking specifically for the small tag, which is kind of an old school HTML tag. Um, alternatively, we can use uh, XPath. So that may look familiar after what you learned about XPath uh, two weeks ago. You can also specify uh, a class and there are a couple of other options for targeting specific elements on the page. If you wanted to pull out multiple elements, then rather than using find, find element, element, you're going, going to use find elements. elements. But, but the, the syntax, syntax is exactly, exactly the same. same. So, so the first thing, thing you specify is how are you going, going to be determining which, which elements you're interested in. And the second thing is just providing that additional information. So in this case, we're using a CSS selector, and that is the selector. And the result that we get back is not a web element. Now it's a list of web elements. Right? So the class of the result, there's my results. Check on the class. It's a list. And if we take a look at the class of the first element in that list, we see that it's a web element. And in this case, I get back, if I look at the length of that list, 10 elements. So the first page on this website has 10 chunks for this uh, quote class. Okay, now, in much the same way as with RVS, you can kind of recursively um, or iteratively dig down through the structure of the page, you can do exactly the same thing with uh, Selenium as well. Um, but there's a, a new pair of functions for doing this, right? We've just seen find element and find elements. And these are the two methods that allow us to target particular content within the page. But if you're wanting to start from a web element and then recursively find contents, you're then going to use the find chi child element and the find child elements. But the, the operation is precisely uh, the same. So let's see how that would work. So supposing we have, um, we've got this first quote, which we uh, defined earlier, right? And this basically targets this entire uh, set of tags, everything starting from the, the first instance of the quote class. If I wanted to extract content from within this, 
then I'm going to use one of those new methods that you've just seen. So for example, I could start with my first quote uh, object and I can use the find child element to search within that first quote. And here I'm once again using a CSS selector, but I'm targeting this text class. So now I'm starting in this uh, class uh, this div with class of quote, I'm searching within it and I'm ending up targeting that tag there because it has the, the text class. So you have two approaches here. The one is to, to use find element and find elements to basically search from the top of the document tree and you can also use these other two methods to search within subsets of tags on, on the page. Right. So presuming that we have managed to use those four methods to find the tags that we're interested in, the next thing is to actually get content out from those tags. So how do we go about doing that? Well, there are a couple of methods for this. These are methods on the web element objects. So you can't run these on the page. You would run these on the web elements that you've discovered by using those find element methods. So the first one is we take our web element and we run this get element text method that extracts the, the text within that element. We can also use the get element attribute method to get the values of specific attributes. So here I'm pulling out the href attribute from the first author link tag. So this first author link is pointing to an anchor tag on a page and I'm pulling out the href attribute for that. And it's pointing me to this other URL. Okay, so let's let's try this out. Right? Um, we're gonna do we're gonna target the, the R Selenium homepage and we're gonna do a bit of navigation around that and extract some content and we're going to write this um, crawler from scratch now or more or less from scratch. So I've got the, the basic framework for doing this. Uh, let's see where is that? Mm, that one, this one. Right. So this is this file is available on the Our Ladies repository. Uh, so you can follow along with this or try it out uh, for yourselves after after the session. First thing we're going to do is set up the, the URL and we should probably open that up in our browser as well so we can see what we're targeting. So this is the, the site that we're taking a look at. Alright, so there's lots of stuff on the site. We're going to do a bit of navigation around and we're going to extract some content from it as well. So we've already got Docker, uh, Docker with Selenium up and running so we don't need to worry about that. We've got our VNC viewer up and running as well. I'm going to close down the existing browser because we're going to open up another one now. And we're going to, I'm going to just clear up my terminal and maybe restart my R session as well. Oh, that's, that's just delightful. <laughs> I'm immediately having re regrets about restarting my session because now I have to find everything, I guess. Okay, let's go and find that stuff. There's always something. Alright, so let's go back to the R ladies. There we go. Okay, there we go. This linear exercise. Right, so setting up the URL variable. Um, pulling in the R Selenium library and now we're going to do some stuff. So the first thing we're going to do is create a connection to Selenium then we're going to open up a browser and then we're going to navigate to this URL. So we're going to do this over here. So I'm going to start off by creating my browser object and I'm going to run the remote driver function from the RCDM package and I'm going to provide it with three things. So the first one is going to be the, the browser name. Um, browser name and that's going to be Chrome and then I'm going to provide it with the remote server uh, server address 
and that's going to be my local machine and then I'm going to give it the port which is going to be 4444 and I've clearly done something heinous For the argument okay next we're going to open up the browser so at the moment there's nothing actually visible in VNC so I'm going to cause bra call browser open All right and you can see this is the stuff that you get if you don't specify silent equals true so it's just a little bit of noise on your terminal back in VNC we see we've got an empty browser now and we can now go browser uh, navigate and we're going to navigate to that URL and so back here in VNC we can see that it's opening up that page right so we're now in a position where we can actually start extracting content and we're going to do two things here we're going to get the current URL and we're going to get the page title so we're going to use both those methods that you just saw in the slides so browser it's going to be get current URL and run that so that's the URL that we just specified. And we can also do browser get title. And that should give us the title for the page. So R bindings for Selenium driver. If we go back here. That's the, there you go, R bindings for Selenium web driver. That was easy enough. Let's clean that up. Okay, we're going to take a screenshot and save it to this RCM homepage. Uh, PNG file, so we're going to run browser dollar screenshot, and I'm going to just specify the file is that. Okay, and let's go and see if we can find that screenshot. I think I need to go up my folder. There we go, our Selenium homepage, and there is the screenshot for the page. The only problem with this is that it's not a full page screenshot, right? It's only giving me a screenshot of the content that's immediately visible here. But there's a whole lot of content that we only see if we scroll down. And so that's one of the, the shortcomings of this um, simple screenshot functionality. But it's still super useful. Right. The next thing we're going to do is find the element which contains the current package version. So this is, let's go and have a look at where that is on the page. Where is that? Ah, up here at the top here. So up in the nav bar, we've got uh, v1.7.6. And to just save myself a bit of effort, I've got that um, CSS selector scribbled down. So I'm going to be lazy and do this. So browser. Uh, find element. Um, I need to specify two things. So using equals CSS selector, and now I need to provide the CSS selector, and that is I, I, and with a child of small. Okay, but we need to actually assign that to a variable. So I'm going to assign that to version. All right, and now I can go and take a look at running um, some methods on that. So I'm going to get the element text, right? Because we have, that's that's the text that's contained within that tag. So get element, element, there we go, text. There we go. So we've got back the, the version string from the page, which is kind of nice. We're now going to play around with getting a, a multiple elements from the page. So we're going to find the elements which links to articles. So these are, we're going to find them in the navigation bar. We're going to find out how many, how many articles there are, and then finally we're going to print out the URL for each of those articles. So let's go back to the browser and see what I'm talking about. Up here in the articles, if you click on the articles drop down, you've got these various articles. Each of them is a link, as you can see when I hover over them, they highlight. And what I'm going to do is extract the, the URLs for each of those. So once again, I've got the CSS selector for that so I'm going to cheat and just make use of that because it's quite long 
and convoluted. So I'm going to just create a variable which I'm going to call links in the browser and then find elements, so plural because I'm expecting multiple elements now. So using once again CSS selector and the actual CSS selector I'm going to copy and paste. Right. So when I run that, now take a look at links. You can see that it is a list with a whole bunch of stuff in it. How many articles are there? Well, we can just run uh, length on links. And it tells us there are seven. If we go back, we can validate one, two, three, four, five, six, seven indeed. And now what we're going to do is iterate over those and just extract the, the URLs. And I'm going to do this just by simply creating a, a for loop. So for link and links. And then for each of those, I'm going to go and do link and get element attribute. And I'm wanting to have the href attribute, right? Because each of those is an anchor tag. It's got an href that gives the URL that it's pointing to. And I'm going to print that. Let's see where that gets us. Okay, so you can see that I've gained those URLs, but each the result in each case is a list with one element. So I'm going to want to specify just the first element from that list. Right, there are the, the links to each of those articles. Right, uh, and then finally we got to just close, uh, clean things up. So browser close, there we go. And the browser is now gone. Okay, so a very simple illustration of how you go about building just a basic crawler to go and grab a bit of content from, from a website. We're gonna do things that are a little bit more interesting presently. Okay, so let me close that and head back to the slides. There we go. Okay, so we've um, we've navigated around the page. We've got some information from elements on the page. What about actually interacting with those elements, like clicking them, for example? Well, for that, we use the click element method. So. It's supposing that our browser is currently located at this address, so we can find that by running the, the get current URL method. If we want to go and navigate to another location, remember we earlier created this first author link, right? So that, that's actually the web element for an anchor on the page. If we go and run the click element method, Selenium is literally going to go and click on that link so that the browser takes us to a new location. So after that, you'll see that we have now navigated to another page. So we got the, the new pages URL by once again running the get current URL method. So for any link on the page, you can tell Selenium to go and click on it and Selenium will obediently then follow that link to another page. All right. As we saw earlier, we can also use the, the go back and go forward uh, methods to navigate around. So at the moment, we're on the, the home page for uh, Albert Einstein. We can use the, the go back method to return to the previous page. So just to check, we were previously on the home page. We then navigated to Albert's uh, page. We're now on Albert's page and we're going back to the previous location, which is the home page, and we can run go forward to go back to uh, Einstein's home page. Now, importantly, one of, one of the reasons that you might want to use um, Selenium for interacting with a site is that site may have uh, forms on it which you want to fill. So for example, the site may have a, a login form and you're only actually able to access the content of that site once you've logged in. So in order to do that, we need to not only be able to just select elements on the page, but we need to be able to insert content into those elements. So to illustrate how this is done, we're going to navigate to the, the login page on that same site. And we're then going to find 
the element in which you're supposed to type the username. So I'm using the find element method and I'm specifying the ID, right? So very useful, this ID specifies uniquely the, the form field uh, to um, insert the username. And then once I've got that username web element, I'm then going to run the send keys to element method. And that's going to literally send text content to that element on the page. Importantly though, the argument to the send keys to element uh, method is a list. Right? So we're sending a list that contains only a single element and that is the string that we want inserted into that field. Now, in addition to just sending plain text like Joe42, we might also want to send other special uh, keys to the page. So for example, you may want to send like the page down or the page up keys to the page. And the way that you do this is by using the, the cell keys variable, right? Cell keys has got all of these 50 odd special keys in it. And you can see amongst them, we've got the page up, we've got page down, we've got all of the arrows, right arrow, down arrow, we've got the insert key, the delete key, all of these things are all captured in this um, vector of unique special keys. Well, I think it's a list actually. And if we want to send some of these, well, if supposing we filled in the, the username field, what we could do is we could find the selector for the password field and then go and insert text into the password field. But what's actually more convenient is to do it the way that you would do it if you were interacting with this form on the keyboard. You'd probably just press the tab key and the focus of the browser would normally just go from the username field to the password field. Or well, we can do this in Selenium by sending a tab to the browser, right? So we're doing username, send keys to elements. So we're, we're addressing the username field, we're sending keys to it, and the key that we're sending is this tab key from the cell keys list. And the result is that the focus now shifts from the username field to the password field. And you can do the same thing that we did back here. You can use the send keys to element to insert the password field and then you'd go and select the login button and you'd click on the login button and Selenium would immediately log you into the site. Right, so now on to waiting. So we, we've seen that waiting is important and that sometimes that your Selenium script will break because you haven't been sufficiently patient waiting for the content to actually be rendered onto the page. So what you can do is you can introduce static sleeps or even random sleeps into your script so you're literally telling your script okay wait for five seconds until the page presumably has fully rendered and then continue but the, the problem with this is that what happens if the page hasn't fully rendered within those five seconds well then okay you Rather than making it five seconds, you're going to make it 30 seconds or maybe a minute or maybe five minutes to be absolutely sure that the page has rendered fully. But the downside to this is that it's going to mean that your scraper is going to run progressively more and more slowly. So this may or may not be a bad thing. On the one hand, it's good to scrape a website gently. But on the other hand, you don't want to be too gentle that it takes forever for you to extract the information. Fortunately, there's a way of actually specifying uh, to Selenium that it should just wait until the things that you're interested in are visible. So what we can do is we can set an implicit wait timeout. So this is a method that's run directly on the, the uh, remote driver class. And what it does is it tells Selenium that if you run either the find element or the find elements uh, methods looking for some content on the page what it should do is it should implicitly wait in this case up to 30 seconds for that content to become available and if it becomes available within those 30 seconds then your script will proceed if not only then will you get an error so this is a very nice compromise because your your script will only wait long enough for the content that you're interested in to become visible and no longer. So provided that you set a reasonable threshold for this timeout, you should be absolutely fine. 
There are actually a couple of other timeouts that you can specify. So there's a, a page load timeout. This is how long to wait before generating an error on a page load. You can also run a, a JavaScript script within a page. And this is, again, how long to wait for that script to complete. And finally, the implicit type, which is basically just giving you the same thing that you would get with the set implicit wait timeout method. Right, we're kind of getting towards the end of things now and getting to the place where we know enough to attack the, that lawyer site again. One thing that's worth pointing out here, and this is very often the way that I use um, Selenium, uh, it, is that it's possible to use Selenium to navigate the website and to uh, ensure that all of your dynamic content is rendered on the page but then to use rvest to do the extraction from the page. And the reason I like this is that I find that the, the syntax of rvest for identifying components in the page and extracting their content is a little bit more intuitive than like, the methods that are offered in Selenium. You, make no mistake, whatever you can do with rvest, you can also do in Selenium. This is just a, a question of convenience and being accustomed to the notation. So if you want to use RVEST for extraction in conjunction with Selenium. How do you go about doing that? Well, you're going to run the get page source method on your browser. So once your page is fully rendered, you then run the get page source. And what that does is it dumps the entire HTML content of that page, including all the stuff that's been rendered using JavaScript. And in this case, I'm feeding into this variable HTML. And this variable HTML is analogous to what I would get back from read underscore HTML in my plain vanilla RVEST. The only difference being that it now contains this dynamically rendered content as well. And now once I've got that, I can then go and pull in RVEST. I can, since this is a string containing like the HTML for the page, I still need to push it through the read HTML function, which is going to essentially pass the content of that page and just work out what the structure of the page is. And once that's done, I can then go and use my normal uh, verbs from within RVEST. So, so um, it's not really a verb, is it? It's a noun. So identify a node on the page with a title tag, and then go and extract the corresponding text. And we get precisely the same content that we extracted a little bit earlier, but using um, the functionality in Selenium. Here we're doing it. Selenium for extracting the content, and RVEST for actually getting the stuff out of the page. Okay, final point. This works really nicely if you're wanting to have tabular data because there is no support for tabular data in Selenium or R Selenium. So if you're wanting to get tabular data out from Selenium, you literally need to go and navigate the table yourself. And this can be extremely onerous. Right? The much better alternative is to go and grab the page source, put it through into RVEST, and then use the HTML table uh, function, which will give you, uh, which will take the tab tabular content from HTML and convert it directly into a data frame. Very easy and simply. Okay, now let me just uh, consult my watch for time and think about things for a moment. Um, so so I'm going to quickly show you um, the GitHub script with the, the implicit weight and demonstrate to you that it will actually run from top to bottom as promised. So let me do that. Um, this is the one with the weight in it. Yes, there we go. Okay. So this is essentially the same GitHub script that we, we saw earlier, but it's also got this um, timeout set in it here. So as we're going to go and load the page in the browser. We're going to set the timeout. And then we're going to do the same operations that we did before and finally go and get the, the author's profile link and just print to the console. So I'm going to clean up my console here and then make sure that my VNC is empty. Go back to our studio, hit the source button cross my fingers, go back to VNC, and there we go. 
It's navigating around the site. Aha! Uh -huh. And the browser has disappeared, which indicates that it's got to the end of the script. And here you can see that it has gone and retrieved the title um, as well as the, the URL for, for the, the user's profile. Okay, so by simply adding in this one extra thing, the implicit timeout uh, wait, we were able to ensure that the browser waits long enough for the content that we're interested in to actually be visible on the page. Okay, now the, the next thing that I wanted to show you is a, a slightly more interesting uh, demonstration and that is to go and extract uh, content from, from uh, Amazon. So you can't do this with a regular RFest because the, the content on Amazon is dynamically rendered. So let's just go across to, uh, we'll, we'll see this in, in Selenium anyway. We're going to set up the, the URL. Uh, we're going to pull in the various libraries deployer per because we're going to be uh, we're going to be using a little bit of a functional programming to iterate over a series of items. Stringer for sorting out strings and Selenium, of course, for interacting with Selenium. And we are going to instantiate our browser and open up the web page. So we should see right there's our, our Amazon home page and now we can start doing interesting things so what we're going to do is ultimately we're going to search for um, books about data science but we need to jump through a couple of hoops uh, first in order to make that happen so the first thing we need to do is um, I want to specify that I'm looking at books uh, so that's is by specifying on this drop down here I get all these various categories of items on Amazon but of course I don't want to do this manually I want to do it in code so I go and find the, the uh, CSS selector for that drop down that I've just clicked and that's this hash search drop down box and I find that element on the page and I assign it to this variable called category and then I'm going to click on that element so remember there's nothing clicked at present. If I go back to our studio and run these two lines and then pop back to VNC, you can see that in R, I've now clicked on that drop down. Now, we, th there are two approaches now to what we could do. So we're, we're wanting to click on the element that contains the, the term book. Um, I'm going to take the CSS approach, um, but Actually, a, a more sort of straightforward approach would be to use XPath because, and I think I did mention this two weeks ago, with XPath you have the capacity to build a selector that actually targets elements on the page based on the text that they contain. So in this case, that would be ideally suited for what we wanted to do because we wanted to get the, the components in that list that contains the term book. We're going to go about doing this in a little bit more long-winded way just because it illustrates a few more things that are useful to us. So we haven't yet seen how we can search within a, a web element and this is precisely what we're going to do here, right? So we've just created this category variable and that corresponds to that the drop-down list. We're going to go and search within that category by using the find child elements and we're going to pick out all of the option tags within that drop-down and we're then going to go and iterate over them. So if I run this by itself, I'm going to get back a list. Right? So these list, this list corresponds to all of the items in that dropdown. I'm then going to use the map uh, to character function from the per package, and I'm going to it's going to receive this list of elements through the pipe and I'm providing it with its second argument which is the function that's going to be applied to each of those elements. And this is what the function looks like. It takes an argument called tag and it extracts the text element from that tag and just returns that. So if I run this I'm going to get back the text elements from each of those tags and then for good measure at the end here I've tacked on string trim just in case there's some white space at the beginning or end of those. So now if I take a look at my options, I can see those are all the options in the drop down list. I'm wanting to identify the one for books. So I'm using the which function and seeing which element in that list is equal to books. That tells me 
uh, box index is item number six. You can see that up in my uh, global environment. I'm then going to go and in code create a CSS selector. So I'm, I've got basically a template for a CSS selector and I've got this nth child uh, and I'm specifying number six but I'm inserting it from the books index uh, variable using sprintf. So if we take a look at the books selector now it's pulling out the sixth uh, child uh, option tag. So we can now take this dynamically created CSS selector and use it with find element. So there it is. There's my, my CSS selector that we've just created. All right. I select that element and now I'm going to go and click on it. And if we check in VNC, nothing seems to have really changed apart from the fact that the, the drop down has disappeared. But we can actually go and validate that it's been selected by going and clicking on the drop down again. And there you can see that books, well, <laughs> it had been selected until I went and hovered over it. Let's go and reselect it. Okay, so we're now in a position where we can start inserting something to search for. So now I need to go and pick out the, the search box. And this is what the CSS selector for that looks like, right? Again, it's got an ID, which makes it very convenient. So I've now got the search box and I'm now going to send text content to that search box. So search box is currently empty. I'm going to use the send keys to element method and I'm going to send it the term data science. So we get a search for data science books. Right, so you can see data science has now been inserted into that field and I've got this drop down of, of suggestions from Amazon, which I'm going to ignore. What I'm going to do right now is go and click on the, the search uh, button on the right hand side there which is the icon uh, that looks like a magnifying glass. So again I need to go and find the, the selector for that and this is what it looks like. So we're using uh, an ID and then looking for this particular input element which with type submit so that corresponds to that button. Finding that selector and then we're going to go and just click on it. And if we go back to Amazon we should see aha it's now gone executed that search and return the results to me. So I now have a selection of data science books uh, on Amazon. So I can now go and extract uh, information from them. So I'm going to now use the find elements method on my browser and go and extract. Well, I'm going to go and identify the sort of the block for each of those books. So you, basically this kind of block of content for each of the books is what I'm going to grab first. So that's the CSS selector, which I identified using uh, developer tools. Run that and check on how many items I've got. So there's 16 items on the page. And now with a bit of work, we can go and extract the information from each of those items. So I know this looks like a lot of uh, complicated code here, but let's just take a look at what's happening. We're going to be using the mapdf um, function from per. It's iterating over the items list. So this is the list of those 16 items on the page. So each of those blocks corresponding to a book. We have a function now that accepts an item and then does some stuff. So that stuff is this. Firstly, it goes and finds this anchor tag. Now this anchor is actually um, the, the link here. So it's got the, the name of the book but it's, it's a, an anchor tag, which means that it's actually linking through to the specific page for this particular book. So we're gonna to want to get two things. The one is the name of the book, and the other is the URL for the specific page that that book is listed on. We're gonna get both of those things from this anchor tag. So we're using the find child element. We're searching within that particular block or item, and we're picking out this uh, tag, the anchor tag, we're then going and using the uh, get element text method to get the, the name of the book. And we're getting, using the get element attribute method to get the href attribute. So that's going to give us the two things, the name and the link. And then finally, I've got this string replace from stringer. And what this is doing is basically stripping off like the, the nonsense at the end of the, the URL. Um, it's not actually needed. So this is like the UTM and things that are 
bits and pieces that are passed around uh, with URLs, but are not necessary for actually locating the page. So I'm just stripping that off. And then finally, taking the title and the URL and returning them as a tibble. So the tibble is returned by each of these function calls. It's going to have only a single line, but the map df function is going to concatenate those all together to give me a nice big data frame with all 16 of those elements in it. So if I run that now, it's going to take a moment or two because Selenium is not blazingly fast. The results have been stored in this variable called books. And if I now take a look at books, I can see that I've got all of that delicious data. If I look at it in my viewer, there we go. So we've got the names of the books and we've also got their corresponding URLs. So this is potentially super useful information. And if there are multiple pages of books, and for data science there most likely are, then what we could do next is we could go and click the pagination buttons at the bottom of the page, move on to the next page of results, scrape those as well, concatenate them onto our existing data set, etc., and keep on doing that until we get to the end of the pagination. Job done. Right, with the, the 15 minutes that remain, I'm um, going to take a look at the, the web Wenzel, but I'm going to cheat here because I don't think that we honestly have enough time to put this all together in 15 minutes. So I'm going to go and find the, uh, the actual code that I prepared for this. And we can just run through that. I know I'm getting, I'm getting lazy and I'm tired and I'm hungry. All right, so in the lab folder, there we go, Rebel Wenzel. Right, so let's clean up my console. Right, so this is the, the URL that we're targeting, right, just as a reminder, this is what it looks like. So we've got all of these specialists, we've got their names, their position, so this guy's an associate, he's based in Johannesburg, that's his phone number, and that's his email address. And the same applies to everyone else on this page. We will get all of that information. So let's go and see how that's gonna happen. We set up the URL, and we are pulling in the, the various libraries that we're gonna use. We're doing the three basic things that we're gonna do at the beginning of every Selenium script. So we're creating our remote driver, we're opening up the browser, and we're navigating to the, the base URL. So we do those things. We check in VNC to see, aha, it is indeed opening up the, the first page, so the page of A's. Now, I, I'm gonna want to, um, I'm gonna want to get all of these lawyers, right? So I, I could write a series of kind of of four loops to iterate through each of the letters on the page and uh, I could write all of my code inside those four loops and it would probably be functional but it would be quite sort of ugly and easy to and, and hard to follow. So a better approach would be to, to write a function and that function should accept a letter say A or B or C or D and it would then go and extract the content for people who have a name that begin with that particular letter. Then all I need to do is iterate over the letters in the alphabet and go and grab all of the content for all of these specialists. That's definitely the preferred approach. So you want to take the things that you write and wrap them up in functions. The, the reason that this is a good thing to do is because a function is something that's easy to test. Right? I'm going to write a function that's going to work for people whose name begins with A. And in principle, that function should then work for all of the other letters in, in the alphabet. Okay, so let's take a look at what that function looks like. So it's going to be called get letter. It's going to accept an argument, which is just a letter. And then it's going to go and do a whole bunch of stuff. Let's break down what it's actually doing. So the first thing that it does is it's going to go and find the, the selector at the top of the page um, with all of those buttons in it. Right? So it's going to go and pick out this element that encloses all of these letter buttons. Right? And then what we're going to do next is search within that element. So if I just right click on this, 
inspect. Let's do that again. So we're going to be targeting um, one of these higher level uh, tags. Oh no, actually not. I think we're going to be targeting this these tags here. So these A button tags. We're going to be pulling all of those out. So we're going to using getting multiple selectors, multiple elements, all of these A button uh, tags. Let's go back to the script. Yes, that's what we're doing. So we're targeting all of those A buttons. Um, let me, just for illustration purposes, I'm going to set uh, this argument letter. I'm going to set letter equals A. Right, so let's go and grab all of those elements. I'm going to look at alphabet. So it's a list. Check the length of the list. 26 elements as expected. And what I'm going to now do is uh, I'm going to find the element in that list of elements that corresponds to my chosen uh, letter. And so there's quite a lot going on in the statement here. I'm going to start from inside and work outwards. So what I've got here is a mapping. So map character from per. I'm iterating over alphabets, so the tags that I've just identified, and for each of those, I'm running the get element text method. So this is going to return basically the letters from A through Z. Now I could, I could hard code this into my script, right? I, I mean, actually, R already has this variable called letters, so I could use that. But this is a more robust approach because supposing on the website, they didn't have anyone whose name began with Q. Potentially, Q then might not actually be listed. So I would then only have 25 letters in the, the alphabet on the page. So it's much more robust to use the letters from the page than to simply assume that all 26 letters will be represented on the page. So I'm getting back this vector of letters. I'm then equating it, or comparing at least, to my chosen letter. So this should bring back a series of true and false values, where the first one is going to be true, because letter is equal to A. And then I'm finally calling which, which is going to tell me which item in that list is true. It's one, right? So that's now getting pushed into letter position. And I'm now going and indexing into my list of web elements. I'm picking out the first one and I'm going in clicking on it. To make this a little bit more interesting, let's make letter equal C. I will go and find the position. So letter position should now be three. And I'm going to go and click on letter number three. So at the moment I'm seeing A's. I'm going to go and click on the C. And we've now moved on to C. So these are all people whose surname begins with C. I was quite gratified that when I was looking at this page earlier that there's a Collier on the page. Okay, actually a Kate Collier and I have a cousin called Kate Collier who's not a lawyer, but I, I digress. Anyway, okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to use a method called uh, execute script. So what this is, and we haven't spoken about this in the slides, but it's going to allow us to actually run a chunk of JavaScript on the page. And so I'm going to run this piece of JavaScript on the page, which is going to scroll us down to the bottom of the page. So let's see what happened there. Right, so we've now gone down to the bottom of the page. Why did I do this? Well, it's in order to ensure that all of the JavaScript on the page has actually been executed. If, for example, you are uh, crawling uh, LinkedIn, which incidentally is a, a lovely challenge to undertake, then you'll discover that the, the content on LinkedIn is like it's rendered dynamically in chunks. And if you want to get, for example, all of the items that are shared by a particular person, you literally need to keep on paging down until you get to the end of the list. And only when you get to the end of the list is all of that content present on the page, and only then can you start extracting. So this is what we've done here. We've paged all the way down to the bottom to ensure that we see everything that's on the page. Right, we can now go and uh, find the individual specialists. So this is the CSS selector for these 
blocks, right? There's one block for each of the specialists. We're going to pull that out and we're going to call it specialists. So this is now going to be another list. So specialists. So there's 17 specialists on the page whose names begin with C. And we're now going to iterate over those, once again using the mapdf function. And now we're going to iterate over one specialist at a time. And we're going to now employ another method that we haven't spoken about, and that is moves, move, <laughs> mouse move to location. This again is important because we, we need to actually see the content on the page in CDM in order to extract that content. So for each of those specialists, we're going to shift them into the field of view. And we then, once they're visible, we're going to extract their content. So this is going to move them into the view. Then we're going to sleep for just a moment. Again, this is a, to ensure that um, if Slim has been a bit laggy, that the content should have been rendered. The other thing that it does is it ensures that we're not hitting the website too hard. So we're introducing some delay into what we're doing. And then finally, we're going and within this um, specialist tag, we're going and extracting all of the relevant information. So we gain the name, location, role, phone, and email, and returning all of that as a one-line tibble. And mapdf is going to take that and concatenate it all together to form a single data frame with all of that uh, together. And that then, this consolidated data frame is what's going to be returned by the function. So let's evaluate the function and give it a whirl. So we're currently on the page for C. So let's try it with M. So we're navigating to the M page. We've gone to the bottom of the page. We're now going up to the top. And we're going to start grabbing information for each of these. And you can see what's happening is each of those blocks is scrolling into view. It's being selected. And then the corresponding content is then being extracted. And I can see that M was maybe a poor choice because there are lots of options here. So since it's almost 7 o'clock and this is still chugging away, uh, Megan and or Astrid, I'd be happy to take some questions. And hopefully in the course of those, this data will become available. Presuming there are some questions. So Selenium, although it's a, a really handy tool for, for web scraping, I think the actual intention for the development of Selenium is as a testing tool. So it's normally used to perform automated tests on websites or, or apps. Um, and like certainly my, my previous employer, they're developing online gaming uh, software, which is runs in a browser. And so they use Selenium quite extensively with all of these automated tests to like, run on the page with Selenium. Super handy tool for that. Okay, well that just to fill up the last couple of minutes um, on this, maybe some sort of high level thoughts about like, the, the R versus Python question. Um, so you know, you've seen basically the, the most sort of prevalent packages for doing web scraping in R. And I think that, that you, can, you can go an awfully long way with those. Um, but it's also, if, you, if you're developing like um, production grade uh, web scrapers, it's really worthwhile considering Python as an alternative. Because there are a couple of frameworks in Python that make this a, a lot easier. Uh, and the, the one of those that I work with quite extensively is called Scrapey. And it has um, a very neat functionality that allows you to build a, a crawler that will basically navigate the entire structure of a site and return all of the pages uh, and, in, in, and in the process extract the content from those pages with actually a remarkably concise amount of code. So 
that that's well worth looking into as as an alternative option. But like no, R also super great. Okay, it looks yes. Well, I mean, so I think the short answer to that is like, yes, it's always feasible. You know, if, if you can see the content uh, as, as a human browsing the website, then you can also scrape it. Um, you know, they can make it very difficult for you by putting captures on the page. Um, but there's always a way around those things. So yeah, I, um, I, I definitely think it's, it's feasible. I guess the, I mean, to your second point, the technical challenge is going to be actually navigating the content on those sites and it, it depends very much on how the site is architected uh, you know if there's a nice sort of regular layout to the content on the site then you can probably get that information quite easily but um, my experience with things like medical aid is that they have like web pages and those web pages then allow you to download a pdf catalog and that pdf catalog is what actually tells you about the policy um, so you know that that then raises the level of difficulty a little bit because you get to write a crawler to go and find the pdf documents you then need to automatically um, process the content of those pdf documents which incidentally is is perfectly possible and they're great tools in r and python for doing precisely that but that then becomes a much more challenging problem but i mean i think there's definitely a business application there you know gathering data on medical aid um, uh, offerings. For sure. I mean, you think that that's a, a pretty common thing in, in the insurance industry. You like have this sort of meta insurance broker that's going to tell you like the best uh, insurer for, for your particular profile and requirements. It, it, anyway, while, while we're chatting about this, let's pop back to R and take a look. So there are uh, those specialists and uh, since I didn't store that value let's just go and take a look there they are all of those people whose names surnames begin with an M I've got their location I've got their role I've got their phone number and I've got their email address so first thing tomorrow morning I'm going to be contacting these people and selling them my insurance policy and they will buy For sure, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that like, it's a bit of a two-edged sword. You, you want, I guess, in the case of lawyers, for example, you want the public to be able to contact them. But on the other hand, you know, it, it can be like, quite a privacy concern. It's a tricky one. For sure. You, you <laughs> You got to get back a whole lot of errors. I eh? mean, could get a 503 error as well, which basically just means the site is not going to talk to you anymore. Um, so yeah, definitely. If you're getting a 429, it just means you need to slow down. So introduce some delays between your requests. Um, another thing that's maybe worth thinking about in this context, if you if you're getting a too many requests error, is that it's possible that you might be requesting the same page multiple times. And, and I know that this sounds like unre unlikely, but it, it's perfectly feasible. If you're sort of navigating an entire site, um, it's possible to go and actually hit the same page multiple times. So you know, be careful that, that you're only hitting each page once. And since I'm thinking about this, the, another package that I, I thought I might talk about today, but I just obviously don't have the time, is polite 
So Polite is a package that's basically built on top of like RVEST and HTTR and a couple of other packages. Oh, and Memoize. And it uses um, Memoize to actually cache the contents of, of a, a HTML response so that if you do request the same page twice, it uses the cached copy. So this can definitely help you hitting the same endpoint more than once and possibly will then reduce the, like, the impact on the on the site. But yeah, I mean, bottom line, you just need to slow down, uh, add, add in more, uh, more delays between your requests. Um, okay, so Suman asks, is it possible to get around a capture with dynamic scraping? <laughs> um, Yes, I mean, if it's a if it's a very simple capture, like you know the ones that you see with a, a couple of letters and kind of like noise around them, so you can you can grab that image, you can do a bit of uh, OCR on that, um, and you can use that. You can obviously you got there's gonna be a bit of trial and error involved. Um, what we we had a project a couple of years ago where there was a, a capture like that on the site, and what we ended up doing was two things. We, um, we used an online service. So there are a couple of online services that will solve those captures for you. It's essentially a mechanical Turk. So you get the capture, you then submit that capture via an API. Uh, someone sitting somewhere, probably in India, then will solve that capture for you and the API will send you back the result and you then in code obviously take that result and search into the page and solve the capture. And you pay for every submission to that API. Of course, what you really want to do, because for, for a simple capture like that, there's only a, fi a finite, albeit large, number of options, is you can cache those. So what we ended up doing was we took the images, we submitted them to the API, we got the result, and then we also created a hash of the image and the result and stored that in the database. So the next time around, if we got the same image again, we would check our local database using the hash. If we already had it, we'd use it. If not, we'd use the API again. And yeah, that worked remarkably well.